I would like to thanks uh, to thank really to the pacemaking reflection group and also to the foundation of global governance and sustainability for the invitation. Uh, I don't remember what you told about me because I am a retired person, uh, but probably you have some rights. Uh, nevertheless, a retired person, I, I, I say good morning, you, good afternoon to you from Brazil. I am visiting my two grandchildren in Brazil now. <laughs> and uh, the objective naturally is to, uh, my, my idea uh, one year ago when I started to follow the things in Saporizia where was mainly to to draw the attention of the public on the on the on the real situation because naturally the media try to to make a lot of uh, noise sometimes and uh, uh, well my idea was to just to draw attention of the public opinion on the real risks uh, that in my opinion are um, occurred in in Saporizia as well as the implications so so well uh, then let's go through the presentation let me say that uh, Perhaps it's too much information here in this presentation of 33 slides. Nevertheless, I will go through them, uh, trying to offering to you all the, the complete presentation, but uh, focusing on some uh, aspects. No, this is the outline of the presentation. No, um, and but let's let's start saying that operations in nuclear facilities is not a novelty. Historically, we have different uh, cases, especially in 81, 87, uh, 87 uh, with real actions, military actions against nuclear facilities, as well as uh, some actions also during the Slovenian war. But all these actions were somehow ad hoc actions, while in Ukraine now, naturally, we have um, nuclear facilities, Apurizia, under dispute, which is a, a real novel, novelty. Well, this is just the the main nuclear facilities in Ukraine. In red, you can see those being affected now by the war. I mean, naturally, the Saporizhia nuclear power plant. Uh, Chernobyl was intervened, but abandoned later. And also two research centers were uh, subject of explosions. Well, some pictures of these two, uh, of this nuclear center in, Kha in Kharkiv. Uh, they suffered, especially in February, March, uh, in March and in, in June of last year, very heavy uh, damages. Well, uh, what is the situation internationally, juridically, on the on on, on this issue? Uh, military um, um, facilities under uh, nuclear facilities under military uh, context. There is the uh, additional protocol one of the Geneva uh, Conventions uh, addressing in the Article fifty six. Uh, uh, the protection of several facilities which can uh, uh, lead to uh, big damage in population. But the uh, Russian Federation ratified and then later withdraw the ratification. And also among other countries, the United States never ratified this and explicitly rejects the Article 6 in their uh, Law of War manual. So it means that uh, mm, this is not fully formally covered. There is also the Convention on Physical Protection of Nuclear Material and Nuclear Facilities, but this is more for sabotage uh, uh, context. And uh, naturally, this, this aspect was already recognized by the General Assembly of the IAEA in, uh, four years ago. Uh, and recently, in the last year, after the outbreak of the war, there were also attempts to, to move in the, uh, in the proper di direction, but failed. Uh, in August last year, the, non, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference uh, wanted to include the scenarios with uh, 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 similar to Saporizia, and also in September, the General Conference of the IEA uh, tried to, uh, to have a resolution on the risks of fighting of the Ukrainian nuclear power plants, but it was rejected by Russia and other countries, also considering that uh, Saporizia was already located in a Russian province. So all this uh, is a, it means I am not an, an expert on legal issues, juridical issues, but nevertheless, all these points a certain legal vacuum. So it means that attacking a nuclear facility may formally not be illegal. Uh, formally, no. This is this is already a, a big point. So today, just today, the general conference of the IAEA starts in Vienna. 
So, naturally, these this issues will be discussed uh, during all this week. Just to mention two uh, positive examples, the non-nuclear aggression agreement treaty between Pakistan and, and uh, India, ratified in 91, and also the same year, the, the, the ABAC agreement between Brazil and Argentina, more for safeguards. But nevertheless, there are good examples in the world. Uh, just to say that Zaporizhia uh, produced before the, the, the war 27% of the Ukrainian uh, electricity, six uh, Russian rea designed reactors, Uh, let me let me uh, go uh, quickly through the technical issues here. I mean, uh, all the uh, the six reactors for those not uh, very familiar with nuclear issues. I mean, the reactors are in shutdown condition since one year, since uh, September last year. But uh, mm, let's say that they need also electricity for safety systems, for maintenance uh, works, and so on. So it means that. Uh, it, it, in the, in the case in the case of Zaporizhia, uh, they have they have four uh, um, high voltage lines uh, to 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 produce electricity to deliver electricity, but also to receive. Plus, in this case, six support lines. From these ten lines, uh, presently only two are operational, are, are active. So, but let's say that. Uh, uh, um, for the case that you cannot receive electricity from outside, you have uh, here in the, in the top, you have the emergency diesel generators. Initially were 13, now they have 20. And this is in the case that you don't ha have electricity from outside, you can produce your electricity with these emergency diesel generators. But just to say, that for the first time in the seven, uh, third, in the seventh, uh, in the 37 years, of lifetime, lifetime of Saporizia had to be used, these emergency diesel generators. And not only once, seven times. So it means that during seven times in the last months, since, uh, since uh, October last year, the facilities were operated with their own electricity, with the diesel, emergency diesel generators. This is really uh, unacceptable. Uh, this is not uh, sustainable. Also in, in November, of last year, all four Ukrainian nuclear power plants were simultaneously suffered also the loss of uh, off-site power. So they had also to, to be maintained and to be operated by diesel, emergency diesel generators. On one side, this is the electricity. On the other side is the, uh, the cooling reserve. There is some noise here. Here is a picture of the Kajovka Dam, which uh, serves as a reservoir for the cooling of the, of the nuclear power plant. You will remember that now in June, this reservoir, the dam was destroyed. So it means that uh, the 16 meter high and the 2,100 square kilometers water, all this water disappeared. So uh, the majority of this water disappeared. So not, not only the human environmental disaster and the, until Black Sea, but uh, was a risk for the cooling of the uh, facility of the Saporizhia nuclear power plant. In fact, uh, uh, to have cooling during the electricity, but you have also water. There is no imminent loss of cooling, but uh, uh, there are, uh, let's say now, emergency procedures to be, to be used. And uh, in this sense, uh, this is important to say, this is the, the cooling pond of Saporizia. Here was the reservoir and the cooling pond is by design higher. And here you have the six reactors, no? And, uh, but basically, just to say that uh, after Fukushima accident, in Europe, there were a kind of uh, uh, plans of stress tests for all European nuclear facilities. And Ukraine was also included also participated. So at that time, also national action plan was uh, prepared uh, by, by Ukraine and has been reviewed several times. And this uh, action plan also considered the break, the, the breach of, of, of uh, Sak uh, Sakovka Dam. So uh, it means that basically um, they are now trying to, to maintain the cooling this is stable. There is no imminent risk, but uh, this is not uh, also sustainable 
situation. As for those not being familiar, this is just a fuel as assembly of, of the VBR reactors. And just, just to tell you that the, the, the nuclear reaction uh, uh, occurs within these tubes, uh, fuel rods, and this is a fuel assembly. This is a fuel assembly with more or less 300 fuel rods here. And naturally, even the, even the reaction is stopped, you have a lot of heat inside the, the fuel rods because of uh, residual uh, heat or, uh, of uh, fission products. And this should be evacuated, should be cooled. This is uh, a picture of the, of the fuel assembly. This is the core with many fuel assemblies. But the point is that if because of lack of power supply and insufficient water reservoir, you could have a fuel meltdown accident. This is a kind of type uh, accident like in Fukushima. Here should be much lower because naturally the reactors are, are stopped since one year. So the residual heat to be cooled is much lower, is much lower. But nevertheless, if there would not be enough uh, power supply and water, you could have a Fukushima type a scenario even with, with lower, lower uh, impact than, than than Fukushima, but naturally also with a uh, kind of political impact very, uh, and increasing the dimension of the world. Um, further to this technical issue, uh, also the, the staff, uh, operating staff of Saporizia are suffering uh, difficult situation. The uh, city in Ergodar suffered restrictions in the past winter and also recently also drone strikes. Many operators and families abandoned, abandoned the, the, um, the, the city. The Ukrainian operators remaining has, uh, had signed uh, contracts with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, Rosatom to, to maintain the, the work. And there is also confusion on responsibilities for safety and emergency scenarios because the Ukrainian regulator uh, still tries to have control on the, on the, on the facility. All this even the, 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 the professional performance of the, of the operators uh, make difficult the in-service inspection and maintenance tasks. So it means the safety culture is not the best here. And then another risk is direct impacts, explosion or sabotage. I mean, you could, uh, you have, uh, have here the reactors, with containment, but you have other installations here which are not so protected like the containment. So it means that if you have in fact, like here, it was in a non irradiated fuel and waste storage in August last year. But if the impact could be also to electrical systems which supply to safety systems or irradiated fuel or waste storage and so on, you could have also radiological impact. So it means the, the Saporizia nuclear power plant is fragile. Eh? It's fragile because there is a reduction in safety levels and margins because of these issues we have mentioned, and also the dubious capacity to fully carry out all in-service inspection because of reduction of personnel. There is only one third personnel of the, in comparison to the beginning of the war. Also reduction in sterile contractors and shortages of specific spare parts. So this, has, this is really reduction in safety levels and margins. And then also the risk of direct explosion, sabotage, et cetera. Naturally, the agency have sent, uh, started to visit visited, uh, Saporizia, this is, this is wrong, in, in September 7, uh, established the monthly shifts of nuclear inspectors. And since January, also all other nuclear power plants in Ukraine have also inspectors. But naturally, the presence and action of, of the agency protects and helps Saporizia and inform the world of the situation. Nevertheless, they don't have necessarily always full access to all equipment. This is something to be correct. Let's go, let's go through. There is some noise there. Uh, let me say that... Uh, Please mute your uh, microphone. Sorry, sorry, Alejandro. I will try to mute them myself. No. Those not speaking, please mute your microphones. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, one of the issues at the beginning, one of the actions, military actions in nuclear facility was in Kersko, in the, in the uh, Slovenian facility in, uh, 32 years ago. This led to some technical assessments, but these technical assessments were not considered to, to produce 
standards for uh, military uh, or war uh, context because the agency don't have mandate to consider nuclear facilities an armed conflict. So uh, the agency established seven pillars for nuclear security and safety, integral, integral uh, physical integrity of facilities, the maintaining safety and security systems, the working conditions of operators, the external power supply, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, when they arrived in September, they realized that none of them were fully complied. Also, uh, they established uh, uh, the urgent establishment of a safety protection zone demilitarized around Saporizhia. Because this zone was not uh, achieved, this uh, safety protection zone, in, in, in May of this year, the Security Council also endorsed the, these principles, five principles established by the agency. Uh, no attacks from or against the plan, uh, storage, uh, no storage of uh, weaponry or military personnel, assuring external power, uh, power supply, and uh, also uh, protected from attack or sabotage. Sabotage is also a possible issue. So it means that we have seven pillars and five uh, principles. And uh, uh, also from the beginning, a working group was established by the agency. They met already eight times. Uh, in November, there will be the next uh, uh, Committee of Safety Standards. Uh, is planned in, in November. And uh, this working group met eight times, and they are going to publish a, a technical document, technical document addressing some issues, addressing what practical applicability of the current standards, shortcomings, and challenges in application. So these are things, naturally, that could help for the future. OK. Uh, I don't know where I went to, to kick, no? This is still time. So just to- No, no, to, don't to worry, Alejandro. Watch. Yes, we have time. We have it's another okay. seven okay. minutes, okay. at least. OK, OK. So the point is, for the first time in history, a nuclear power plant has become a military objective in the front line of a war. So this is still under dispute. So then there is a current need of a ratified global convention or treaty. Ratified is the point, because we have also the protocol one of the uh, Geneva Convention, but uh, should be ratified. But why? Uh, one can think that the, in the war, naturally, some parts will not... Uh, respect uh, whatever treaty convention is on, but it's also important to have this ratified by everybody or to have more reinforced in order to prevent normalization of potential future attacks in other crises in the world. Uh, we're thinking also, we know that there are other parts of the world that the, 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 if at the end in, in Saporizhia there, the, the, there is some radiological accident with political impact and so on, this could be also used, I don't know, uh, I don't. I, I, I don't know anybody to say something, but we know that there are some places in the world with uh, big crises. So to prevent normalization of future attacks, to delegitimate any war action, and to deny the possibility to justify it. This is very important. And then also, uh, there is a damage in the credibility of nuclear power. If conventional nuclear fission power should continue producing electricity for the world, the challenge of the international community is to ensure that the facilities remain strictly outside any armed conflict. And you can understand the public opinion thinking, OK, we know, we knew that uh, uh, nuclear facilities were very dangerous. Naturally, if you put bombs on, on, on them, uh, for sure. And the second point, uh, the fragility. So uh, there is this in decrease in safety margins and, le and, and, and levels. So the operation of Saporizia is un unsustainable in the medium term. Uh, we ho everybody would think uh, if the war finishes, it will be the best solution. Uh, so the inspectors of the agency don't have still full access to every, every place. And uh, uh, Director General Grossi said Saporizia is in a kind of grace period. And I added, which is not infinite, the grace period, no? But this is very important. It was mentioned by uh, Director General Grossi already months ago. So I am personally convinced of the technical professionalism of the operating staff. They are working uh, really hard. They are, have reinforced the, the, uh, the cooling uh, pot. Uh, 
that they have uh, put further physical protection and so on. But naturally, if uh, they are uh, they are they they cannot decide politically. So there are things uh, worse things can occur despite the, the the objectives of the operators there, Russian and Ukrainians, to do the best. No. Uh, so an, uh, uh, yeah, a possible nuclear accident with radi radiological impact, uh, cross-border radiological impact, and indiscriminate will scale the dimension of the world naturally. And the international community should be able to act before it occurs. And to finalize the finalize the, the presentation uh, in re, uh, with regard to the standards, uh, well, when we had the Chernobyl, uh, further nuclear safety standards were were developed. There were already safety standards, but there was a real push to have more comprehensive, more complete, more exhaustive standards. Fukushima also led to different action plans. Uh, to 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 check uh, the reaction uh, stress test to check the reactions of the facilities towards uh, against against uh, real stream uh, events like tsunami flooding earthquakes and so on so uh, why not this war if finishes well and so on should should not legitimate legitimize the IAEA to control and support facilities with own standards. This is something which is missing now. No? So probably the IEA mandate should be reconsidered. And then, uh, uh, well, there is also very important, uh, whatever will be developed by the by this working group and so on, uh, and finally adopted by the agency. Um, uh, it is very important also to identify responsibilities for nuclear safety and security in, in a case in a war context, especially in a case of hijacked facility as in Saporizia. There are some people saying this is nuclear uh, piracy. No? Okay, but this is very important because this is the first time that hostile actions by state actors have occurred against nuclear facilities. And this opens a new dimension of nuclear security risks and operations. Up to now, the security, the nuclear security, uh, uh, did not consider, uh, let's say, hostile actions of uh, uh, state actors in another facility, uh, in a dispute uh, facility. So, uh, among them, naturally, the establishment of nuclear safety and security protection zones, perhaps under international control. All these are things that have been will be discussed this week in Vienna in the General uh, Assembly of the IAEA. And just to finish, uh, I had the opportunity to, to visit the Russian Museum in St. Petersburg. And when I saw this picture already year, many years ago, I was very impressed. Ilya, Ilya Repin is a, a Ukrainian war Russian uh, a painter of uh, the end of the 19th century. And uh, well, these are the Cossacks, which are the people from Saporizhia. And uh, you see, this is a picture from which all Russian uh, citizens were very proud, also the Ukrainians, is located in St. Petersburg. And they are uh, Saporizhians. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Alejandro. That was great, and I think we understand better not only the problems with the specific uh, power plant in the specific context of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, but also the need to be prepared for other similar, possibly similar events and to really use this bad uh, occasion or dangerous occasion to uh, secure uh, the warring parties and the world at large for future possible attacks on uh, nuclear power plants. So th thank you very much for combining both of these dimensions. And I'm sure there'll be questions. There is one technical question already in the chat. Just to tell you as a background that the Peacemaking Reflection Group, the group of former UN staff supported by FOGS, um, has already sent a letter to the Secretary General of the UN and the Director General of uh, IAEA, also um, raising the, ringing the alarm bells for, for Zaporizhia some months ago, and I'll send you the link where you can find uh, our work in that respect. But for now, we have one technical question in the chat, at least one, and I would like also to acknowledge John Rower. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced it properly, but I've met John before. I know how dedicated he is to 
bring people's power to this, uh, um, to protecting this power plant, and he's near Zaporizhia. So he perhaps we'll give him the floor first, and then we we'll go to other questions. But this technical thing, if you want to explain, um, uh, Alejandro, and you can uh, stop the uh, sharing, I think, so that we can all see each other, if you don't mind. Um, okay. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and the you. technical question is, I've done also nuclear engineering of all things, uh, is the decay heat of the reactors? This is a question from Hans uh, Forström. Uh, is the decay heat of the reactor sufficient to keep hot shut down, or is it necessary to make the reactor critical, albeit at a lower at a low power level? You want well, to... yes. Thank you, Hans. I am very happy to see Hans Forstrom was my head during seven, four to eight years in the in the nineties in in Brussels. Uh, nice to see you, uh, uh, Hans. I, uh, it is my understanding that now the only one reactor, the six, the number six, is in in, in let's say uh, hot shutdown. The other reactors uh, are in in cold shutdown or in maintenance uh, situation. Uh, hot uh, hot shutdown are, is not critical. Uh, they are uh, they are using the pumps to have this uh, hot sh uh, shutdown condition, which is. I understand in our in our uh, Western pressurized water reactors not a very usual operating uh, situation. They are using this. Uh, uh, they are using the, the the main pumps of the primary circuit to to produce a minimum of uh, uh, steam in order to to deal with uh, reductive waste. Basically, this is my understanding. Only one of the six uh, uh, reactors is in this hot shutdown condition. And this is against <clears throat> this is against the the indications, the regulatory orders of the of the Ukrainian regulator, and this is just one of the cases where the responsibility of the of the operation is in dispute between the Russian operator uh, regulator and the Ukrainian regulator. So Ukrainian regulator tries to to emit regulatory orders, uh, but naturally now the the facility is under under Russian control. So this is one example. Another example of of uh, mismatching uh, opinions between Russians and Ukrainians was at the beginning of this year, the Russians intended to put in operation the reactor number five in order to deliver some electricity to to their new provinces, let's say. And uh, well, at the end, it was not uh, possible because of different uh, military situations and technical reasons. But naturally, the Ukrainian uh, regulator also said this is not uh, permitted by us until we will not recover the plant. So I don't know Thank whether. You. I... Yeah, Hans, is that okay? You want to ask a follow-up question or? No, it's. I, I think uh, the most important answer was it's not a critical reactor, so they don't produce new radioactivity. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so if we can give the floor now to John, is he still there to tell us how are things in Zaporizhia itself? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, and connection is good. I'm going to sell a connection hotspot. So we are in um, Marganets, which is about 10 kilometers across the, what used to be a river, is now mostly mud flat uh, from, from the power plant in, in Hodar. Uh, we are here to try to uh, mobilize civil society to give more support to what the unarmed civilian uh, International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors are doing inside the plant. We are finding this very, very difficult. Uh, the level of understanding on this side of the river um, is that when the inspectors came, they, the amount of Russian shelling of this city increased. So they see it as a negative because they don't fully understand the tremendous work that those inspectors are doing, keeping the plant safe. So one of the things we're doing here is educating people about that to appreciate what the inspectors are doing and try to support them in, in a greater greater way. Uh, but lots and lots of problems here, lots and lots of fear, as much because of the war as because of the, the nuclear power plant. Uh, we spent the last few days before coming here in Zaporizhia City, about 40 kilometers north, talking to 
uh, internally displaced people from Enohodar themselves. So we talked to people who worked at the plant, lived at the plant, whose husbands lived at the plant, and engineers there, getting a feel for what happened when the Russians took over. It's been a fascinating story that I'll have to give a talk on sometime. Right. Thank you very much. So you are on the Ukrainian side still, right? Or on territory yes. controlled by Ukraine? We tried, we were here in April talking to people and all agreed that we can't keep the plate safe without more cooperation from the Russians. So we tried to contact everybody we could in the occupied territories. And the people who were our, who knew those people in the territories said, no way, no Westerners are going to uh, be able to talk to anybody there without putting those people at great risk. So we went to the Russian embassy in Washington, D.C. and told them what we wanted to do. They said, this is a war. You're crazy. But we talked to them for some time and they said, maybe this is a good idea. They asked for the names of all the people. We recruited people from India and Iran and Africa that were maybe more friendly or at least less hostile to Russia. So they really gave us a hearing. They were very polite, took a couple of weeks to decide and finally said, no, it's too dangerous. We won't facilitate visas. So we haven't given up on that idea, but the hope is to get civilians on both sides to push their militaries to stop shelling near the plant, which both sides are doing. And you have been talking to IAA also, right? Yes, they know we're here. Um, they can't work with us in any formal way because their work is so focused and so fragile with the Russians that they can't afford even the slightest bit of uh, complication. Right. Thank you. Thank you for doing what you're doing also. Uh, and uh, now questions, if you want to raise your electronic hand and we'll take a couple of questions, then go back to Alejandro. And if anybody wants to make also a small intervention, you can do it as part of this process. You know where the electronic hand is, reactions, and you can see a hand that you can raise there. So, If uh, it's taking time, I can ask Alejandro. Yeah. George, yes. I, had, I had my hand raised and Francis uh, as well. I don't know if my Oh, I, I don't it. see them. Okay. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Ken Kian, is that you? Yes, it's me. Um, Frank Hank, Young, Hank Young Brinkman, uh, Permanent Observer of the International Development Law Organization. Um, sorry, my voice is not great at the moment. Hopefully it, it remains okay. Um, it's a... The, I'm wondering whether you could comment on, uh, you know, what the SG could do. The, would it really um, be a possibility that just like with the Black Sea Grain Initiative, the SG brings the um, uh, uh, you know the Russians and the Ukrainians together and and forces an agreement uh, to establish a safety zone? Because that's I think the most um, likely scenario for increasing the safety in the immediately um, future. Um, the second point is, uh, you know, about um, uh, a, a staff of the International Atomic Energy Agency at the plant, which it seems that also that has reduced the risks. But um, I, I'm not exactly sure. You didn't say too much about it, Alejandro. So I would like to hear from you about it. And third, um, you know, you suggested the new norms and treaties and and I'm really wondering, you know, I am all for it. Um, I, you know, that's where the UN is uh, really good at. But I'm really wondering whether that will make any difference at the moment. I mean, you, you look at uh, the, the the most fundamental uh, treaty that the international uh, community has, the charter, has been um, blatantly violated. Um, I'm, I'm not going into double standards and all of that because I, I have views on that as well, but just looking at the case right now, uh, international humanitarian law is, of course, violated every time they're bombing um, uh, deliberately uh, civilian infrastructure or civilians. And this, I'm, I'm sure, happens on both sides, but I, I, I as, as Alejandro also said, of the bombing of the nuclear power plant. Um, uh, so uh, really saying, you know, what would a what would the difference really make um, to have uh, such norms? Thanks. Thank you, Hengen. Mm -hmm. uh, Frank. So we we'll take a couple of questions. Yeah. Right. Th thank uh, you very much. And first of all, uh, great thanks to uh, you, uh, Yorgos, uh, and the Fogs, uh, and also to Alejandro. 
uh, for this excellent presentation and to John for his uh, update on the situation on the spot. Um, I've been a little bit disinvolved from a PRG for some weeks uh, as I'm going through an experience uh, a little bit like the Spartan one, here, uh, <laughs> but I should be a bit more engaged, hopefully, in the weeks to come. Um, uh, just for the benefit of Alejandro and, and, and others who are outside the PRG up to now, um, we have uh, stimulated three appeals um, uh, to world leaders about the Zaporizhia case, one through the Interaction Council, another through the Nsami Ganjavi International Center, and a third from ourselves. Um, they seem to have fallen largely on deaf ears because we haven't heard much coming out of the Security Council, I think that would have been music to our ears in the situation. But my my basic uh, question, uh, maybe in two parts, would be, um, what is it that we, former UN staff, can do through the Peacemaking Reflection Group to um, raise awareness on, on the, the risks and advocate for very specific policy measures, including, I mean, without necessarily getting into the, the treaty perspectives, but things that could be practical on the ground and preventative in effect. So that would be uh, one part of the question. And the other would be uh, taking a slightly longer perspective on this, but only by a year. Um, what should we be doing in this general regard uh, with a view to the summit on the future in 2024. Are there issues that should be brought up and, and clarified in some coherent way? Uh, priorities from the point of view of your study, Alejandro, and, and uh, other experts here present. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Yes, indeed, we have been working also on the new agenda for peace. I don't know if that's related, but it's about nuclear disarmament accidents perhaps too. So yeah, we're great to hear from Alejandro. After John, John may ask, but also answer partly what we want to be done by us, by the SG, please. Yeah, let me get my technical question out of the way for Alejandro. Um, we know that these, these reactors and containment buildings that are an entirely different and much safer design than Chernobyl and they're shut down. So there's no chance of the recreation of Chernobyl. However, Chernobyl only had two or three years of nuclear waste sitting in unprotected storage pools and casks. And this reactor has 38 years of nuclear waste. Can you give us any idea of the volume of severe radio nucleides that are sitting in those pools? I imagine myself, if the worst case scenario in my mind is Russia begins to lose the war and their parting shot to Ukraine, is to dirty bomb this, this thing. It seems in my mind that they could almost decide how much conventional explosive to create a dirty bomb of any size they wanted. My biggest, is that true? And secondly, how big could that dirty bomb get if they really put some heavy explosive to get most of that 37 years released? Any, any ballpark idea for what we could be talking about? Wow. Right, TNT equivalent or whatever, <laughs> we can see. Alejandro. Well, perhaps I will start from the, the last question, uh, but I have also some other nuclear colleagues here who, who can help if needed. Um, we understand that uh, naturally Chernobyl is now a uh, site for locating uh, waste also, nuclear waste, radioactive waste from, from different uh, uh, Ukrainian nuclear facilities. Uh, Chernobyl is not uh, anymore intervened by 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 the Russians. Uh, your question, uh, if I understand correctly, is whether the worst uh, case accident in Saporizhia uh, could uh, how could be this case? Uh, well, mm, for sure not as, as Chernobyl because uh, Chernobyl was a uh, criticality accident, and here is more a question of of, of cooling or uh, bombing of some nuclear facilities. In my opinion, in my modest opinion, a potential accident here could have will have much lower impact than Fukushima on radiological uh, perspective. But nevertheless, the psychological 
uh, impact will be great, as you can imagine. Even uh, there will be a, a, a limited release of radioactivity to the environment will be indiscriminate and will be trans, uh, trans frontier released. So uh, the the political impact and, and the dimension of the war will 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 increase. Uh, but uh, I don't expect a dramatic. Uh, in the worst case, for me, will not be as dramatic as as important. Chernobyl for sure, and even like Fukushima will be much lower. But naturally, under war conditions and so on, the political impact. Uh, Will be will be great. Will change uh, perhaps all the context of the war. Eh? And naturally, uh, if one of the parts, if, if the Russian uh, think uh, that they cannot maintain the the facility, they can have the temptation. The political uh, people could have the temptation to destroy uh, Saporizia. But destroying Saporizia could be with or without radiological impact. Let's say. Uh, you could uh, you could damage the facility without uh, damaging nuclear systems. So you could destroy the the, the turbines uh, buildings, and this facility will never be operable again. So as they did with uh, the flight uh, the, the the plane um, Antonov, if I remember well, no. So destroying something which you could not use anymore. This could be a possibility for sure. I don't know whether they answer sufficiently your question, uh, John. If I may then... add this, in the pollution thing, it's when you have radio waste, if it is broken, burst, let's say the dam, wherever they hold it, and goes into the stream, the water stream, or goes all the way to the Black Sea or no. whatever, things no, like if, that. If, if there will be a, a fuel, fuel uh, meltdown accident, which is if you cannot cool uh, and you cannot uh, extract the, the residual heat, uh, you could have uh, a fuel meltdown accident like in Fukushima. In Fukushima, naturally you have four reactors and many irradiated fuel storage with a high content of radioactivity. If the, 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 uh, the fuels are melt, so all, uh, let's say, uh, gaseous uh, radioactive products, some of them very radioactive, will be released to the atmosphere. So here, after one year uh, without critical reactors, the residual heat is much lower. So nevertheless, the, the possible fuel meltdown could occur, but will occur in a much lower volume, in much much lower release of, uh, of uh, gaseous reductive uh, products. It, this is more... Uh, this is more uh, to the atmosphere, will be more to the atmosphere than to the river, in principle. No? Also because the reservoir now is uh, almost empty. No? Uh, but yeah, the impact, even much lower than Fukushima, will be uh, level four, at, at least in the, in the international nuclear events scale. And uh, Fukushima was number seven. Uh, and this will have also, will have, uh, depending on the duration of the release and the winds and so on will have impact also in, in neighboring countries, even perhaps the very surely the the the, uh, the, the radioactivity itself will be much lower, but uh, the, the political impact will be great and the, the environmental impact also very important for sure, but cannot be compared with with uh, with Fukushima. Uh, with Chernobyl, for sure not, and even not with Fukushima, in my modest opinion. So then there was also a question uh, on the a new treaty, whether a new treaty will will change many things. Uh, in the in the in the uh, in the present war, I mean, uh, in whatever war, uh, uh, some of the parts of the parts will not. Uh, necessarily um, respect any convention. Uh, the necessity to have uh, something uh, well established and recognized by everybody perhaps will come after the war, and especially if they are, we will have still to, to see uh, very catastrophic scenarios. In that case, probably the, the international community will react and will have something more robust, more ratified by everybody. But nevertheless, uh, in my opinion, this is not 
sufficient reason not to try to do it because of this example. Uh, avoiding avoiding uh, avoiding the example uh, could also um, spare uh, future problems. Uh, this is, and then uh, I think there were well the risks. We have spoken sufficiently about the risks. And a previous question: How an agency could uh, could uh, proceed or perform to to try to 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 to, to, uh, to achieve an agreement between Russians and, and Ukrainians. The point is, I did not understand which agency um, uh, was mentioned here. But uh, uh, I think that the, all the efforts to try to, to bring uh, both parties to, to a negotiation table is, are valid. We should also understand that uh, part of the world, especially emerging countries, uh, other continents where we are not located and so on, uh, they have uh, perhaps, uh, um, uh, let's say, more neutral, they say themselves, more neutral position. And perhaps these people can also help. There are different initiatives. I am now in Brazil. You know that President Lula is one of the promoters of a fair way to bring both parties together to, to a negotiation. But naturally, there are support many political implications uh, and interest and so on that escape to my knowledge and to my capabilities that uh, it is very difficult to, to understand. But I think that we, or at least I as public opinion member, we should try to, 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 to do our, our best to, 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 to create a kind of uh, public opinion tendency or, or current uh, asking, requesting for for a peace uh, agreement. Uh, peace agreement now will avoid many problems in the future and uh, the, the yeah. establishing or the advancing negotiation of a new convention will be in this direction. Alejandro, uh, I, my, my point was whether the Secretary General should directly get involved. I mean, ah, we, we, know, we, we know he, he has been very hesitant to uh, start negotiating a peace agreement because he has been saying the time is not right for that. But just like with the Black Sea Grain Initiative, a specific safety zone around the nuclear power plant is something that he might be interested in negotiating and whether that would be something um, that could help in the immediate future and something that he, sh he should do and we should push for. Yes. In fact, I'm sure that if there will be some reductive release. This forum will will naturally have many things to do and more, much more influence. But for sure, we have try, we have to try all all possibilities, all all from the, all different angles to avoid it. Also, right? And and Frank wanted also to ask about the PRC, what we can do as group here. But John also wants to say something. John. Uh, we yeah, cannot I, hear you. yeah, I've been I've been watching the situation through my friends' uh, 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 WhatsApps and so forth on almost a daily basis for the last year, and I just want to give two examples. I think this this uh, IAEA has made a tremendous difference. Forgetting the absolutely critical work of looking over the shoulders of these operators who are operating under conditions that no one approves of, that under such stress, hearing explosions every other day around them, just making sure mistakes are made has to be the single best best thing they're doing. But the two examples that I can give that I've seen in real time are, one, when the Ukraine Defense Agency put out intelligence that the Russians are gonna destroy the plant or are gonna bomb the plant. Uh, that was two or three months ago. It went all over the place. The people, the Ukrainians on the ground were texting me these, these alarms and I was reading and I went right to the IAEA site and looked up other sources and was able to reassure them that no, there's no evidence of that just because it's on a telegram channel somewhere does not make it true. And I could see the relief in, in our context. I, among other people, were really nervous about whether that cooling system, how long that would last and what they were going to do about it. I was under the impression that it had uh, maybe just a matter of days before they would not be able to pump enough water 
and being able to read and and I know my people in in on in uh, Ukraine were starting to get very nervous because we've all heard for the whole time that if coolant fails either by water or le- lack of electricity that that's when the disaster starts. That kind of escalation of anxiety and fear must have been happening on the Russian side too. Having the IAEA say, no, we're here, we're taking care of the water, we've got another six months of water supply, made a huge difference to me, let alone the people that have less knowledge about this. So I really want to commend them and say how much we need to support that effort. We've got to make it look like it's more than just four or six or whatever they have on site now doing this incredible work. Alejandro, you want to also he- listen to what Mats has to say and then reply again because we're, yeah, we're getting a bit close to the end. M- Mats? Yes, so I I wanted to thank you, Alejandro, for a fantastic presentation and PowerPoint. Uh, it leads to a set of proposals that are embedded in your last one or two slides. I would wish to see them developed and even more clear and addressed to the uh, people who can do something about them. My precise question is if there is something in international law that could be strengthened. Much of this is about politics anyway, and we will we have the instruments to do the things we want to do if we can get political consensus. But to raise the threshold beyond which powers should have even greater shame to cross that boundary, cross that threshold. What is it that can be done? And is there something that can be discussed at IAEA's meeting and proposed and, so to speak, get into motion? Well, yes. In fact... uh... In fact, uh, the, um, the agency uh, at the beginning of the war already developed these seven pillars, which were very clear, were not only technical, were also managerial, were administrative and so on. After a while, when they realized that they did not work, also the, the uh, let's say the, the safety exclusion zone did not work, naturally because one part of already what the, the 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 ownership of the of the plant? They established these other five principles. These principles, uh, probably this week in the in the general assembly of the IAEA, uh, we will learn in which extent these principles seem to be uh, respected up to now. But for instance, when two months ago. Uh, uh, the discussion was on possible sabotage and so on. Well, these principles are also very fragile. But let's say that these, these red lines were or have been already established, are already there. And these, these principles will be the basis, part of the basis for possible new developments if the mandate of the agency will be reconsidered. No? And the agency will have uh, clear standards and guidelines for armed uh, conflict scenarios, no. So it means the red the red lines are already there. The set, the first seven pillars were not respected, and now the five principles, which came now in May, uh, seem to be up to now respected. But naturally, it depends on the uh, outcome of the present war on political discussions. Uh, but naturally, they are there, and this is the basis for possible future standards. Right and. What can we do if we can in any way help uh, from you, Alejandro, and, and perhaps John? Can we, let's say, <clears throat> write op-eds or uh, revise your final slides and make them like requests, uh, intervene with the IAEA General Assembly that's coming up, or what can we do? Uh, well, look at, I mean, I, I am not inventing anything. I am, I am just putting together all part of the present discussions uh, all over the world. I mean, I'm trying to have uh, uh, Ukrainian and Russian inputs and uh, naturally the, the inputs of the agency. Uh, so it means that uh, surely there are also more prepared people working in, the, in this direction. But uh, I think that all efforts are, are, are 
are insufficient to try to, to achieve the, the, the goal of stopping the war and assuring the safety of Saporizia and other nuclear facilities. So in my case, uh, I will try to I will continue to 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 try to to deliver this information to the public opinion. I I am invited now next week here in Brazil to to make a webinar for the Brazilian uh, authorities and so on. So uh, this is what I can do. But Natalie, I think that uh, you have you have uh, I think this uh, this uh, your think tank and also uh, the peacemaking uh, group and so on uh, have probably very wide uh, networks on which the the impact and the influence could be could be uh, exerted. So in that case, Natalie, I put uh, my slides. Uh, I deliver you my slides for, for your distribution, consideration, whatever. Everything is insufficient to try to achieve the, the goal. No? Thank you very much, Alejandro. And uh, I think it's not ending here, this discussion. Uh, we'll get back to you also, and if you have any ideas, there are these networks. The intention of all of us is to, to be helpful, avoid, if possible, of course, any bad incident. But if something happens also to use it for future avoidance and, and uh, also bringing an end to the war if we can at least the killing.